picture of my apartment in April of 2016, filled with garbage. You probably think that this is just some sort of accident, that this is just sitting here for a day or two before it gets taken to the dumpster. But this was not an accident. For over a year, this garbage sat in my apartment on purpose. So why would I live like this, surrounded in trash? That's what I'm here to talk to you about. Today, in 2019, we know our world has a problem with plastic. I'm sure you've seen a picture of a beach like this. This is in Indonesia. This is in Nigeria. This is the United Kingdom. Maybe you've heard the prediction from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that by the year 2050, plastic will outweigh fish in the ocean. Or you've seen that viral video clip of a sea turtle getting a plastic straw pulled from its nose. That clip has more than 34 million views on YouTube. So we're aware that plastic is filling up our oceans and that it's not biodegrading. But this awareness is surprisingly recent. A few years ago, I was teaching a class here at DePaul to college freshmen. It was a research writing class, and to help the students decide on a possible writing topic, I asked them one day to brainstorm big problems in our world while I made a list on the whiteboard. They shared many important things, the gender pay gap, food insecurity, institutional racism, and then one student said, climate change, and I piggybacked on this and said, what about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? It was a really interesting moment because the classroom got completely silent, and I could tell that they hadn't followed me. So I asked my students to raise their hands if they had heard of this problem. Fewer than half of the students did. Something really changed in me right then. I realized this was not a problem on every person's radar, but it especially surprised me that it wasn't on young people's radars. I was about their age when I had first heard of this problem, and I remember reading a description of a plastic mass about the size of Texas floating in the Pacific, and I remember thinking, how can we know about this and do nothing? So years later, when I realized that my students still weren't hearing much about this, I felt the strong desire to teach them more and to further educate myself. So I used the Great Pacific Garbage Patch as a model research project. And I showed them how I might transform this into an argumentative research question, such as, can any country clean up the garbage in the Pacific? I started sharing research with them, statistics of whales dying from plastic obstruction in their guts, and pictures of decomposing seabirds with their rib cages filled with neon bottle caps. It was very uplifting. <laughs> The more I shared with my students, the more pictures I showed them, like this, of animals trapped in plastic, the more obsessed I became. So when this class ended, I knew I wasn't finished with this topic. I decided to invest myself more deeply in the fight against plastic. So for a year, from April 2015 to April 2016, I decided to try to give up plastic. I started a blog called Dumping Plastic to talk about my experience, but I wanted to go a step further and give myself a reason not to cheat. So I made a second challenge that any time within that year that I did use plastic, when I couldn't avoid it, I would keep it. So I would commit myself to living in a garbage patch of my own making. I was newly married at the time, and my husband Evan agreed to help me out however he could. So we started by emptying out this huge green storage container and setting it on the back steps of our apartment. That's where I planned to collect all of my unwanted plastic. I armed myself with a reusable drink container and a reusable uh, plastic bag. I'm sorry, not plastic bag, tote bag. <laughs> and I went live with my blog. That spring, when this challenge was just beginning, I felt an enormous amount of excitement and purpose, even amusement. I was fascinated to see where plastic lurks in our day-to-day -day lives, and I was especially curious to see how much plastic one person will use in a year, especially when they're trying to use none at all. 
right away, within my first week, I encountered challenges. I remember going to the grocery store to buy cheese, and this is what I encountered. Literally a wall of plastic. So I left the store without buying anything. That same week, I had to fill a prescription. When I was 18, I was diagnosed with a mild thyroid condition. And it's no big deal, but it means that I have to go to the pharmacy every month. So I took my empty bottle up to the counter, and I asked the pharmacist if I could reuse it. She looked at me really sympathetically, but she just shook her head and said, I'm really sorry. I know it's an issue, but I can't reuse your bottle. It's, it's a hygiene issue. So fast forward a year, and I had all of these. I encountered the same hygiene issue at the deli when trying to get meat or cheese. A few times, people were willing to take my container to fill, but a lot of times, people would tell me they're sorry, I'm just not willing to take the health risk. My initial amusement with this challenge was quickly wearing off. <laughs> Around this time, a friend visiting from out of town bought me a brownie from my favorite bakery, but as he handed it to me, his face completely fell, and he said, I'm so sorry, it's in plastic. <laughs> the same thing happened with my husband. For Christmas, he had gotten me a Cheese of the Month membership. And perhaps you see here that cheese is a theme. It's my favorite food. <laughs> so every month, this wonderful gift arrived in a giant styrofoam cube. And my husband ended up apologizing several times for getting it for me. And I felt like I was becoming the plastic police. This is a picture of my green bin at the end of my first month. So still, with 11 more months to go, I was starting to feel weird, weirder than normal. <laughs> and not in any sort of cool or edgy or eccentric way, but in a really socially isolating way. When I would try to stop wait staff from giving me a plastic straw at a restaurant, I felt high maintenance. I was already so sick and tired of explaining my no plastic rule at deli counters. At work around this time, someone brought a cheesecake to share, but the only utensils were plastic. So I took a piece on a napkin and went into an empty room and ate it alone with my fingers. <laughs> Not a great moment for me. <laughs> I was starting to feel what it's like to try to live outside of the status quo, to have to constant be, constantly be explaining myself. And I was quickly realizing that if you want to live what's considered a normal American life, you cannot give up plastic. It's everywhere. It's in our cars, it's in our clothes, it's in our phones and our computers. It insulates our walls and paints them. It keeps our food fresh. And it's this magic material. It's light, it's cheap, it's clear. It delivers clean water around the world. This experience made me appreciate why plastic is taking over our planet. It's just devastatingly perfect. So in the fall of 2015, my experiment took a slightly darker turn. My husband and I moved and we hired movers. I remember watching in utter horror as they wrapped all of our furniture in this industrial-sized roll of saran wrap to protect it from the snow, which it did, but I then had to keep those yards and yards of plastic. <laughs> and to add insult to injury, I literally had to move my plastic from my old apartment to my new apartment. <laughs> By this time, my plastic had far outgrown that original green bin. But in our new place, we didn't have the same outdoor area to keep it. So my plastic had to come and live inside, in the sunny front part of our living room. As I'm sure you can imagine, it was quite uncomfortable to live surrounded by garbage. Evan and I were starting to fight about it. He understandably wanted it out of sight, but I was collecting it way faster than I'd expected. And the daily burden of having to clean and nest and try to consolidate these containers was crushing. I had also become sort of fanatical at this point about tracking to the point that I was saving used dental floss. 
And when Evan discovered this, he just said, point blank, you're not saving used floss. Um, so I did acquiesce to that. By nine months, I was so ready to give up. I had a rash under my arms from trying to use a plastic-free deodorant bar. My shampoo bar wasn't really cleaning my hair. I almost hit a breaking point one day because I just wanted to make a lasagna, but all of the noodles at the store had one of those plastic windows in the box, and I couldn't find any ricotta or cottage cheese not in a plastic container. To further complicate life at this time, in February, we adopted a puppy. Here she is, looking very innocent. <laughs> so now we were dealing with plastic puppy pads and poop bags and a critter very interested in my piles of garbage. <laughs> I felt like I wasn't learning anything except for how impossible it is to give up plastic. But somehow, I made it the full year, and I spent the spring of 2016 dealing with my mess. I sorted and counted and made a catalog of my plastic. And here are just a few examples of the plastic I used in just that one year. 79 plastic straws, 441 food containers, 170 plastic windowed envelopes, which I especially hate because these come to us completely without our permission. In total, in a year's time, I used 1,441 pieces of plastic, so almost 1,500 when, remember, I was trying to use none at all. I spent the months following this trying to figure out how to recycle or properly dispose of this plastic, and that was equally distressing. Here's a picture of me on <laughs> my first trip to the recycling center looking so excited. But a lot of this trash ended up coming back home with me because it wasn't accepted in the bins. The unfortunate truth is that a lot of plastic can't be recycled because it has added chemicals, fillers that make it longer lasting or more flexible. Plus, it's simply cheaper to make new plastic. And trying to recycle styrofoam was comically hard. I took a 30-minute drive one day to one of the only recycling centers I could find that would accept this material, and my styrofoam basically filled the entire container. I ended this experiment feeling like I had failed. When people would ask me, how do you give up plastic, I had no idea what to tell them. And I wasn't really sure what I had learned. This was such a frustrating year because I felt like so much of my plastic consumption was out of my control. Simply by existing and needing food and medicine and communication, I generated plastic. It took some time to see it, but I did have some small, some small victories, and they've been changes that have stuck. For example, I no longer buy Ziploc bags. I rely instead on foil or Tupperware, which I can reuse. I now buy dish detergent in a box rather than a plastic tub. I don't use produce bags. I just put fruits and veggies directly into my cart. And this has definitely turned many eyes in the checkout line, but it's a change that's become very routine for me. But perhaps the most oddly significant change for me has been this. When I started this challenge, a friend gave me this tin of lip balm. I loved it immediately, and this very tin has lasted me since 2015. So for four years now, I haven't purchased chapstick. Imagine that on a macro scale. Imagine if every person in the US gave up plastic chapstick. There are an estimated 328 million Americans. If we collectively stopped buying chapstick, that would mean over 300 million fewer plastic tubes sitting in landfills or migrating to the ocean. I've realized that this is not the fight of the individual. It's not you, singular, or me. We can't solve this crisis alone. We need collective small change rather than individual big change. So I'm not here today to ask you to go zero waste. I tried to do that, and you can clearly see that I couldn't. But here's what I could do, and I think you could too. 
Give up one plastic item for good. Replace that item with something not in plastic. For example, can you buy eggs in cardboard instead of styrofoam? Can you buy bar soap instead of body wash? Could you buy beans or rice in bulk rather than in plastic bags? Like me, could you give up chapstick? What can you afford and what would you realistically stick to? Because seriously, just one consistent change from all of us would make a difference. Because if we all gave up one plastic item, manufacturers would notice in lost profits. And we need big companies to take action. We have power as consumers to influence the market by what we buy and by what we don't buy. We need to use it. Together, we can pressure manufacturers to give us the plastic-free alternatives we desire. And we're a creative species. I really feel that with our purchasing power, we can influence this creativity. Across the world, we're seeing exciting advances in the fight against plastic. Plastic bag bans here in Chicago, bans on plastic straws in California and Seattle. The EU has voted to ban single-use plastic by 2021 and Taiwan has done the same by 2030. So there is awareness now, and people care. I learned this when I tried to give up plastic. So let's harness this enthusiasm and push it forward. Because if we do nothing, it's not just our oceans and the life within them that suffers. During that year that I taught my students about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, they taught me too. I learned that it's not just a plastic mass in the Pacific, but in every large body of water, including our lakes. One of my students wrote her research paper about the plastic in Lake Michigan. And scientists are finding microplastics everywhere, not only in seafood and sea salt, but in our drinking water, even in North American beer. Even more troubling is that we're lacking long-term studies showing plastic's impact on the human body. Some research has linked a chemical common in plastic, bisphenol A or BPA, with reduced male fertility. And I especially fear this because I now have a son, Charlie. <laughs> I wonder what our beaches will look like when Charlie grows up. And I fear what plastic's doing to his body that I can't see. Now it's on his behalf that I care about this issue. So I urge you to act, not just for the sake of my son, but for the Charlie in your life, your son or daughter, your niece or nephew, your brother or sister. I know what it feels like to live surrounded in garbage, and that is not the legacy they deserve. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm.